So, um, for the end of the day, the last tutorial, I'm sure, especially for those who have been here for all of them, you probably will share that. So, feel free to interrupt and ask questions uh, so that we can sort of circumvent that question. Uh, so, I'm going to be describing uh, you know, some of the things that we can do for this technique of the resonance rate scan. Um, and my interest in the technique comes from my uh, research where I study uh, all the plus materials, but also uh, a lot of computational uh, superconductors that are prevalent when I'm just looking at the which have these very complex space diagrams with various orders and degrees of freedom. And the power of the resonance space scanning technique uh, is that it can really be sensitive to all those degrees of freedom. Uh, and in many measurements, the, the hope is that you can also see all those degrees of freedom that are so, by tomorrow, uh, you, don't forget, you don't remember anything, hopefully you still remember that, some key facts. So, one, I think probably the most important one is that resonance ray scan and probes are behavior of electrons in the same energy. Okay. Uh, probe local electric behavior and many degrees of freedom. Been charged as and that this is all possible because of this resonant condition, which brings you to um, a that enhances an otherwise small second order term perturbation of the um, scattered cross section. Okay, so the resonance is the key thing here. Uh, Basic things about how resonance ray scattering works are to perform the signature facilities. In order to tune to these specific photon energy resonances, you need to have a tunable source of photons. This technique is also incredibly photon hungry, so you need to have really brilliant light sources. So you really have to do this signature facility. Okay. Uh, Depending on the complexity of the resonance X-ray scanning uh, uh, experiments, you can have large, you know, larger and larger degrees of complexity on how the experiments are done. I sort of divide them into three kinds here: um, what are called energy integrated resonance X-ray scanning, uh, also resonant inelastic X-ray scanning grids, which is probably one of the ones uh, you see the most around. And uh, now the ability to do some, uh, especially in the soft x ray vision, fluorometric resonant analysis x ray scattering, where you resolve the polarization of the ultimate photons. Okay. And in doing all this, uh, you can learn more and more about the excitations in the system. Now, uh, I don't have a Highly linearly structured uh, talk. I will start by showing you several examples that relate to my own research of how the experiments can probe these degrees of freedom. And hopefully, uh, you know, you see something that might interest you to apply to your own research, or maybe you can see resonance ray scattering as a technique that might give you some opportunity to solve your own scientific. If you have an idea, you know, look for your local scattering expert, talk to the online scientists, or if you just want to send an email or find me as I'm you know, going to be through here throughout the week on and off, so uh, feel free to just you know, push, uh, pull me aside and discuss some of this. I should emphasize that resonance ray scattering has been a very over the last years, it has really been developing technologically. Okay, so 
has been very exciting in that sense. More and more, you know, high profile experiments were done with this technique. But I think we're only really hitting the surface of what we can measure. I think it partially becomes on one side technologically, uh, we're not, you know, we're always improving. Another side of this is just that uh, we don't quite fully understand what's going on. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, how they can appeal to theorists, you know, to go deeper into this uh, system. So I will uh, uh, start by giving my simplest possible introduction to those max ray scattering, and then I'll show you a few examples of uh, the first one of charge density waves with improved rates. Uh, the second one showing that we can measure magnetic heat on the material we've been studying recently, we've been dealing with over 35. And uh, on the third example, we'll, I'll discuss um, a very acute experiment of calcium glutinate uh, three um, uh, built with manganese. Okay. And then after these examples, I'll go a little bit into um, some of the basic theory and how kind of derive all these things, but just to give you an idea of where uh, things come from. Talk a little bit about practical things and how to do experiments. Uh, and then I'll finish with uh, examples of grids and polarimetric grids on, uh, on data that we think shows an interesting couple between charge and magnetic field. So as I was, as I was saying, technology-wise, okay, uh, there's been a lot of development. If you look at a grid spectrum, I'm doing this in the last wave, and looking at the spectrum of excitations of a, an anti-ferromagnet, uh, a undeleted rate of electron copper oxide. And you can see that in 1996, with an energy resolution of 1.6 electron volts, you have a very broad spectrum. You can't really learn anything about this system very much. Uh, by the time Jacques uh, Mugger and Gavin, which is like a bitch, start making uh, better and better instruments, you can see here, but by the time you have a 0.8 electron volt uh, resolution, you can see that the big blob is actually two beats. Okay, and by the time we push the resolution, it's starting to double eight uh, to 130 million electron volts uh, at the axis uh, in line. You can see that actually that big blob is at least four beats. And the peak that my interest you here is the second peak, okay, so you have the elastic line, and then you have this other guy here. Okay? And this other guy turns out is a, a magnet, okay? Just showing you that um, you can get a spin flip process out of it because of the expanding process. Okay? So let me show you this in more detail here. If you compare it to neutron scattering data, okay, and you go to the same wayback, which is around here. One half zero. You see the energy is around 380 electron volts. When you look at the spectrum at the same Q for uh, a Riggs experiment, you can see that it's also around uh, you know, nearly 300 volts. Okay? And then if you make a comparison between the two, uh, in this paper, so in the 10, it was shown that actually you get a, you know, you see the magnet dispersion both uh, perfectly. Of course, you might ask why. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and is it more sensitive to the neutron than the electron or less sensitive? No, uh, it's going to be So, um, I think it's going to be more sensitive. But that, that will depend on whether the magnetism is going to. Um, so, the question I was posing is why do this? Why do they want to do resonance X-ray scattering instead of doing uh, inelastic uh, neutron scattering? Okay. And there is a very practical reason for this, which is sample size. Okay. So, for that kind of quality data, uh, neutron data, the two grades you may have to ask a student uh, to. Grow 
bunch of different crystals and um, co-orient them with some sample holder and make sure that it's all aligned and the students will be, uh, well, I suppose, might be frustrated, but eventually uh, it's going to get this done and, and get some nice new data. Okay? The kind of resonant elastic X-ray data um, that can give you the same dispersion Okay, but not the same energy resolution that you can get from neutron scatter. Uh, you can do one with the kind of samples. Okay, so a typical spot size of this kind of risk experiment is going to be seven by sixty micrometers. It's going to be small. Okay, so as long as your sample area is going to be larger than that, you're going to be able to get a very large signal. Okay, so the kind of the equivalent for RIS will be then these little black speckles here. These are the samples that are being measured. All right, so uh, additionally, you know, I told you about the content parameter resolution. Really, the, the, the best limit right now is at the RIS instrument at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. Um, where they achieve energy resolutions of the pushes around 30 milliwatt okay. And then there's a similar instrument at uh, MSLS2 at Brookhaven, which is uh, coming online and maybe is on the verge or has just achieved similar kinds of resolutions. I'll show that to you later. Uh, so, Typical problem, what does resonance of the scan measure? Uh, if you, as I did a couple of years ago, but you know, you can just go on the archive and you can look and you see titles that talk about magnetic excitations, spin orbit excitons. Uh, you're looking at uh, super biases, okay? You can uh, look at thin films and things like that. Uh, you can be looking at electron coding coupling. And also superconducting diagram for charge and spin excitations or even the band structure. Okay. So everyone has a proposal and there are many measurements that show that you know in different regimes and different samples you can be sensitive to this. Okay, so you read the resin X-ray scattering paper and it looks like the typical curve that I've been repeating, lattice, spin, orbital, and charge between the freedom, which in essence means that. Same you can measure photons, uh, transition between orbitals, magnets, and so on, okay, and band structure. Now, of course, when you look at a different type of experiment, you know, I do a lot of SCN, for example, so I can just, if I don't, you know, zero order, I can start my paper by saying we measure the local density of states and move on. Uh, maybe if you're doing a neutron measurement, you can, sorry, you can measure it. Extract the dynamic magnetic susceptibility and so on, you're fine, right? And the reason you can say this is because a lot of times you can manipulate, uh, you can present your technique in terms of linear response theory, okay, where you have a probe, you have an interesting system that you're trying to probe, okay, and as you, uh, you know, hammer that system and excite it, that system is going to react. You're going to take something and you're going to make that detection. And then your measured response is just going to be equal to, you know, if your measured response is proportional to the probe, that proportionality is the susceptibility, which tells you something about the system. Resonant X-ray scattering uh, is definitely not that. Okay? It has a complicated expressions for its cross-section, okay. and any manipulations that we try to do to write it in terms of a density, density correlation function or something like that, uh, it's ultimately going to involve some kind of approximation that's terrible. So I recommend just not trying to do that, and we're just going to introduce you to On the other hand, this complication is actually the beauty of the, of the, of the technique, okay? because that is what allows you to study all these degrees of freedom, their couplings. Okay? If you want to 
as such, the coupling between these two groups is different. You need to be able to plot all of these two groups. Uh, now, how those sensitivities are going to happen, there's no general formalism for that, right? You're going to have to think about sort of material as well. Maybe you're going to have to um, find the theorists and say, did I have this data to understand? You know, can you do some simulations and try to figure out if I'm measuring charge or spin or okay. uh, But I think the technique gives you so many beautiful things and data that that shouldn't stop you from doing the experiment. You should do the experiment first and then ask questions later. Okay. So my quick and dirty introduction to resonance ray scanner is the following. Okay, it's going to emphasize one aspect of the resonance. If you want to probe structure, periodic structure, in the electronic structures of the material, of course, if you're thinking about charge, x-rays come to mind. And typically you're going to be thinking about doing a hard x-ray experiment, which is going to be in the range of 10 to 100 kilo electron volts. And you know, at those energies, unless you happen to pay the resonance, you're going to be sensitive to basically all the electrons of this material. Right? Some of the materials we study are very complicated, have many atoms uh, per unit cell, and you know, many electrons. Also, most of the electrons are really uh, you know, much closer to the nucleus, only the various electrons are out there. Okay? So, you can essentially think, you know, if you're if you're probing mostly all the electrons that are in the nuclei, you can think of uh, your atoms in your crystal structure as little points, and you can you know, essentially think of this basic scheme that we learn in the modern states about Bragg's scanner. Just to say that this is a great focus structure. But there might be a situation where instead you want to measure one specific electronic state related to one specific orbital of one specific atom in the C of all those electrons, okay? and then you have to use resonance ray scattering, and the and, 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 and the way it helps you is with this quantum mechanics. Okay. So what are you going to do? You're going to find uh, a particular resonance. What I mean by that is that, for example, if you're copper, uh, we will find that it's roughly that much. 32 electron volts, that's the energy separation between uh, a typical 42 key electron and, and an unoccupied upper 3 key uh, state. And that unoccupied state, of course, is right next to the uh, energy because this thing is roughly like that. Now, you find this resonance by looking at the absorption spectrum as you tune the photon energy in the synchrotron experiment. Uh, you measure the X-ray absorption, and at the point where you see the full absorption, you know that you get that resonance. Okay, so the resonance really looks like a resonance. And then you know, it goes through this intermediate state, okay, uh, where you have you know that electron sort of feeling out what's happening near the thermal energy, uh, and it left a core hole behind, and then it decays, and the photons emitted. Now you have a photon in photon out technique, so you can be scattered at that resonance condition. So, this resonance, which shows a specific element, right? Copper is going to look like copper with resonance. Like a, any copper, regardless of the material, is roughly going to look the same. Uh, and so, and, and and in, in, in this intermediate process, because of the core hole, you really stuck to measuring this copper atom. But you're also sensitive to these intermediate electronic states of the particular atom that you chose. And so, you know, people will say this is a technique that's sensitive to those latent electrons through these intermediate states. Okay? The challenge is then to understand what's sensitive to these intermediate states actually. So, let me show you an example. Okay. Let me really show you with pictures. So, my example here is a, this is something that got really hot a few years ago, six years ago, in my you know, 
Let's see all the papers on those X ray scattering, on footprints. Uh, and, but let me start with questioning from SCM. Okay, so, this is a topogra topographic image of a typical bismuth based footprint where you have the little dots there. Okay, those, with, those are drawn in a square lattice, these are the small ones. And those are just the distance, you know, they're representing the square lattice of the ball. And then you have these squiggly lines there, and those squiggly lines are another structural distortion that happens in these materials. So really you're looking at the structure. This is a topographic image from SCM. This is telling you what you have in part. But if I look at the density of states, the local density of states, uh, this material just above the Fermi level. Okay, so 25 beta electron volts above the Fermi level. This doesn't happen at 50, and it's going to be very suppressed even at zero. Okay, but at 25, you're going to see that on the same area, you can probably see some of the structure elements. And really, what you see is this otherwise checkerboard order. Okay? And just to highlight what you the checkerboard you see here is sort of the basic unit of the checkerboard is this blinking yellow square. Okay. And so this is telling you how the states at 25 bit electron volts are self-organized. Okay. And of course these are states that are you know something about the four which is going to be related to the hybridization between copper 3D and for the Y squared and possibly some PX. That's real space, of course, you can always, you know, it's a scattering technique, so we want to look for things in uh, Fourier space. So uh, if you just take a Fourier transform of that data, uh, you see peaks, uh, which is just to let you transfer between real space and the reciprocal space here. So in the center here is 2 to 0, the peaks related, uh, the direct peaks are on the corner of the image, these peaks are near 0 0.25 reciprocal lattice units, which is a Order of the distance from the center to the corner means things are periodic at the four lattice constants. Okay. And so, what we're getting is hard X-rays, no, right? Because then you have to vary out one single electronic state out of everything else. Uh, you may want to use less than X-ray scan, right? And here, uh, as I said, the and energy states here, the Fermi energy, they also have some oxygen character. So you could have equally chosen, instead of a copper and L edge, you could have chosen an oxygen edge to help you enhance those states. And, uh, and you can do it, it's just you know, for technical reasons, and you can, because you need some energy to have you know, to fit the geometry of the scattering thing, it's easier to do it with a copper. So once you constrain the energy, uh, you can work with your scattered geometry, and you can look for that order. Now, this is where I say the easiest experiment you can do is the energy integrated, as I call it, resonance ray scattering. This is not really a, a standard term, but I'm hoping to make it standard. Uh, because what you're doing here is that you have an incoming beam scattered up your sample, and if you detect all those scattered photons in your, uh, in your detector, regardless of whether the photon went through an elastic process or whether it lost, uh, you know, one electron volt, uh, you count the beam. Okay? Uh, so, I try to call this energy figure a resin x-ray scattering because in the literature you will often find it called a resin Elastic X ray scanning, which is not true. If you want to do a resin elastic X ray scanning, you have to do a resin inelastic X ray scanning, and that would be less than mine. So, elastic and inelastic scanning processes are counted equally. Okay, so we look at now I just jump between two rates, but basically the story is the same. I'm looking at an electron in this case, which is a kind of better slide for this. And as, uh, when you tune the photon energy to the lessness, you measure through the reciprocal space, you see a peak, okay? And this is a very 
looks like a very tiny wave peak. Okay? If you look at the signal is roughly less than 1%, uh, you're still part of your you know, background signal. Whereas if you were measuring, say, a grad peak, that would be little times your uh, background signal. But if you go off resonance by just looking at the total and then you, you know, happen to be one way or the other, then the peak is gone. Okay, so this is really teaching you that it's true that you know sensitivity to the intermediate space that you can really see uh, this kind of a floating state. Uh, and through that, you know that it's not the electronic states related to the top loss cycle. Things have been done in the blueprints, and they used a lot. So that one, that example shows you that the resonance can really bring out really small signals. Uh, and that was an example of charge. Okay. But this, this technique can also measure magnetic fields. So here's at this, uh, we're starting to study this uh, uranium cobalt 25, which is, uh, has a, a magnetic ground state. It's a, you know, in the series of these 115 magnetic terminal typically superconducting materials. Uh, but just to give you an example of an honest to God strong heat. And a magnetic one too. Okay. So uh, here I'm on a log scale, okay, and this thing orders in a magnetic structure that's tried light uh, with a wave vector and this is the left scale that sets it from five to zero point five. Okay, so only one one dimension of the other. And if you go below the transition temperature, the L temperature here is uh, 8.5 Kelvin or so. If you go really low, uh, 4 Kelvin, uh, you can see that the peak is very large, very sharp, and you know, close to the intensity which you expect from a crack peak. Also. Uh, and it shows a beautiful uh, mean field like uh, or parameter. Uh, one thing that does happen, though, that might be hinting a little about, you know, the fact that this actually is an integrated experiment, is that if I go above the transition temperature, okay, even as I go 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 Kelvin, several Kelvin above the transition, uh, you can still detect the peak, okay? Uh, and, you know, really we're measuring now in this region here where this plot actually tells you those things. But the enhancement of the, uh, you know, if you go off resonance, you're not going to see this, but the resonance enhancement is so large that it's allowing you to detect things even above the transition temperature. Okay. And this kind of uh, diffuse scattering, because you're in energy integrated mode, can either be coming from, you know, inelastic, Elastic signal to the dynamic correlations of the world, or it's coming because those dynamic or because the correlations are very short range, you know, and you're really getting a few scattering. In either case, yes. So, what does the K K is the second axis in uh, the reciprocal light space, and so I could write. I could write the peak as H, K, and L. And in this case, the order is around 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.5. So if I sit there and I scan this axis, that's what I'm scanning there from negative to positive. Yeah, so that's 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 the direction of that cut there. But you know, depending on the geometry, you can take a cut along the other direction. Uh, so you know, you're still sensitive to even small portions of uh, shortly correlated uh, uh, orders of the distribution. Let me look at a structural transition. Okay. In this case here, 
there's a non structural distortion that happens uh, around 60 Kelvin. Okay? And as you go below 60 Kelvin, this peak here, H equals 1 quarter, K equals 1 quarter, L equals 0, um, is, uh, appears. Okay? So the structure changes. And here, uh, you could, of course, you could just look at a few transmutinates to this end of Use the ruthenium edge to amplify my signal uh, in the electronic state and the ruthenium oxide. So that's a great choice of edge. Uh, and as you do this, you can, this is the absorption of the light, the of the light, it's the, the energy profile of this peak. You can see that it also keeps on resonance, and you can see the temperature dependent on the peak, and it shows the degree which to do this. But now, the idea is what happens if I remove the routine and substitute some manganese and then decide to use the manganese edge instead. Okay? Sort of use the manganese as like, you know, an infiltrated probe of the environment where the routine oxide is. And in that case, uh, if you do that substitution, in this paper they measured the power of 10% manganese, you can see that at 60 Kelvin, uh, with the 10% manganese, well, they detect the peak at low temperature. And it has the same temperature dependence, more or less, of the, uh, of the measurement from the routine. Okay? And at 10%, uh, it's okay because at 10%, the average distance between the different uh, manganese is going to be comparable to the correlation lengths that quickly develop. Uh, inside the ordered state, so you get a coinciding uh, transition temperature. If instead you choose 5% manganese, it takes a little longer. You, know, you have to cool it down a little more before those you know, um, dilute manganese atoms can actually feel the correlation length of the order. So, this is to say that one, uh, if you don't have the appropriate edge to do your experiment, you can always go to your local synthesis person and ask that team and ask to put some impurities in it. And you can maybe though the, the dopants that you put in are going to be located in a place where you need to you know, be sensitive. You're going to insert in the matrix that you're interested in and you can use that as a probe. In okay. that same vein, you can also say the resonant X-ray scattering because of the you know, site selectivity through the resonance is really also a local probe in the same way that NMR or electron spin resonance, etc. are. So this is the that was the third example, okay. and uh, but now I'll say a little bit about um, some useful things about scattering that might come in handy. Okay. Now I'm not going to talk about, you know, you know, everyone, everyone with a bachelor's in physics knows how to treat electromagnetic radiation and masses of wave and so on. And uh, you probably know how to derive the expression for the pressure cross section based on the mean flux of incoming photons and the flux of scattered photons that you measure. Okay. These are standard textbooks and paints. Uh, and you can arrive at expressions for the scattering of the electromagnetic wave through an electron and so on. Okay. Uh, and then some things. Are we providing the slides? Are we providing the slides? Uh, I don't know. Can you get them to me? I'm not going to go through the detailed equations, but you know, I looked at it so that I have an idea whether I need to provide the slides later. Now, we're going to it's important to talk about structure factors a little bit. So, in graph diffraction, we're basically treating the interference between point charges. 
But really, an atom is not a point charge, it has a uh, density cloud, uh, a cloud of uh, electron density. And uh, you're really interested in the interference you know, that you pick up here is this extra you know, uh, length. Okay? And as long as this length gets you over by a full 2 pi, you get constructive interference. So this is basically uh, uh, mechanics. And but you know for this you have to you have to take your atom and you have to really integrate over all the charge density in your atom and take into account the interference between not only two point charges but the charge located at the rest. Okay. So that's your atomic uh, structure map. Okay. It takes into account the interference between all the charges in your atom. If you move on to having multiple atoms in a unit cell, and then uh, going over multiple unit cells, you have to sum up uh, first over all the form factors inside a single uh, unit cell, and then summing over all the form factors of over all the unit cells. And so you got the form factor for the crystal, uh, reminding you that uh, you have these lattice phase factors. And so whenever, uh, you know, for a crystal structure like this, whenever Q dots with the uh, basis factors to pi times an integer, you end up with this G condition and you get brackets. Practical things, you know, uh, that's if you end up thinking about doing an experiment and you're just trying to figure out how to calculate Q, uh, you have an incoming photon with wave factor k, and if you want to determine that q here, which is the q that you continue to the reciprocal lattice factors and the right key, you have to move your detector to some other angle, and then the subtraction of one wave factor by the other gives you the q, okay? And to tell you, in case you don't know some jargon about this uh, uh, X-ray scanning experiments, uh, the detector angle in relation to the incoming beam is called the two theta angle, which is not two times theta, which is called two theta. And that detector angle is going to determine your Q. Once you have that determined, you know you want to uh, project that Q onto your sample, and so you may want to rotate your sample. If you're in a way in which you Rotate your sample and how this Q is aligned along the A axis of the sample. You can pretty measure the field along the H00 zero zero direction. Okay. And this uh, is called the transmission geometry. Uh, in many cases, present conditions you're interested in might be the soft X rays where the photons can't go through the sample. Okay. And then you have to work in uh, the question geometry. Okay. So in this case, you have a geometry where you probe in peaks along 0, 0, L, but also some mixture of H and L or K and L. Polarizations, uh, depending on how you want the light to follow to the orbital, so you're interested in, you may want to take into account the polarization. So if the polarization is in the scattering plane, then it's called uh, phi scattering, and if it's orthogonal to the scattering plane, so just some practicality in case you're reading papers. Okay, so the the equation where everything comes from is this Cromer's Heisenberg equation. Okay, it's Cromer's and it's Heisenberg's in this 1932. Okay, the quantum mechanics here is not too hard, and uh, it ends up with two terms here. The first one's going to be the Thompson scattering term, and the second one is the second order term, which is going to give you the best information. Now, I'm not going to go through the derivations, but I just want to point out, because I think it's important that if you're going to do an experiment like this, maybe take you know, some time to work over um, you know, how you get there, or if you're a curious, uh, maybe you can do this. I don't know. But basically, uh, you're going to have a Hamiltonian, and you're going to spread the Hamiltonian out into um, the electron, the radiation, and the interaction term, which is going to come from the 
top of the pedestal is constant because um, uh, first year graduate students know or learn. And uh, you have the interaction with the Newtonian, you know how the quantized field it is, you know, you can basically um, open Pythagoras quantum mechanics and see how this works. And basically, you want to know the probability that if you start the system in a state where you have a photon in K and the system is in A, you go to a photon in K prime and the system is in B. And if A is equal to B, that's the last concern, and if A is equal to B, that's going to be the last concern. Can do your typical perturbation theory, get the second order perturbation terms, okay? Apply density of states, etc., go to your uh, to calculate your differential cross section for the scattering. Uh, and my point here is that this is, you know, I find it remarkable the amount of people who do the experiments but actually never went through the trouble of arriving at. So I recommend that if you want to do an experiment like that, you should take a day uh, to go through the derivation. The sum of this, you know, the summary is that the first term, the first order term, it's going to be Thompson scattering. Light comes in, light comes out. Okay. The second term is the resonant term. Okay. For now, uh, the light comes in, you go through the intermediate states to come back down. Light comes out, okay. So you see here, you start at A, you go through some interaction, you take your system to the intermediate states, you go back to B, you will get your whole one. Okay. The, uh, the term in the, in the Denominator here gives what gives you the rest of the condition. So when the photon energy is equal to h bar omega, and only one the photon energy is equal to uh, only one h bar omega is either En minus Ea, the rest of the condition, this is term going to be anything. Okay? Otherwise, this term is going to dominate. But when this is diverging, you can forget about the Thompson scattering mostly. And then you can basically just concentrate on this uh, second order uh, resonance. Sorry? A and B, not necessarily, right? If you if you do an inelastic experiment, if you're looking at an inelastic scatter, you start at A, but you leave your system inside of it. So A is going to be different. It's the elastic part of A is going to be different. Um, should mention though that there are plenty of things that can happen because these, uh, let's, let's call them the Thompson form factor and the that's an X-ray form factor. Once you put all those form factor things in, uh, they can. It's not the summation of the magnitude of both, it's actually there's an interference between them. And so there's that additional complication that I'm not going to go into this. Okay, so all things may come in. Well, if you have a if you have a system that dimerizes, it's a classic case of a virus distortion, where you have your two photons uh, sort of uh, so your two atoms sort of start to dimerize uh, in a lattice that was otherwise periodic every day. Okay? Then you can write those lattice positions as R n equals n a plus some perturbation on it, which can be you know your C D W your cosine two C D W A or other periodic structure. And once you put that into the structure factor, uh, you can get the condition that you require that Q is going to be some number of times pi, 2 pi over a, plus or minus 2 cd over that. You're going to see cdw peaks uh, that are set around to the gravity and so on. Okay. And this kind of structural distortion uh, doesn't require the resonant condition. Okay? Because in this, I could have worked this out in the Thompson scatter and nothing happened. Okay. Which is typically what the hard x-ray scatter is going to do. But if instead, okay, now let's say that what my periodic uh, modulation actually is, is an electronic modulation. Okay? Maybe my electronic states, as I go from one lattice position to the other, 
they change their thickness, if they change their energy level. And if they change their energy level, that means they're going to affect this term here, Dn minus Da, but not, you know, your Thompson scattering. You could also have things that are modulating, you know, your matrix elements itself, which are also, you know, modulations of those end states are not going to be present uh, in your Thompson scattering. So if your valence itself is modulating, you can write this energy difference as an average valence plus some modulation of that valence. Uh, and you can sort of work that out, and uh, if that's small, you can break it out to the uh, to the exponentials, and you're still going to get a D. But this stuff all shows up on resonance. Okay. So this explains to you why, for example, in the full phrase, you have to go on resonance for the case of, uh, that I showed to really see um, the charges. Okay, so the beginning of the experiment is actually the X-ray absorption. Okay, and so when everything is failing, you stop and you say, okay, let's go to the beginning and take X-ray absorption uh, line. And that the X-ray absorption by itself, which is the beginning of the experiment, is already uh, a very powerful technique and hard, and it goes into this. Uh, matrix of four levels of across the fifth solid. Okay. And so, this is just to mention to you that you know, we have to be careful if you are going into resonances that are not simple. Hopper L3 happens to be an easy one, so the way these resonances are uh, indexed is that if your initial state is an n equals 1 state, that's a k edge. If your initial state is an n equals 2 edge, uh, and if you need n equals to say that's an L edge, which is n equals to the n, and so on. Okay. And really, you have to be careful because you're making a transition from maybe like you know creating a four hole in an otherwise full uh, shell, uh, and then creating a four hole there, and then going and you know, adding an electron to another shell that was otherwise open. And so there are lots of things you have to take into account here, Ohm's rules and so on, etc. Uh, and if you're not on a copper edge, things can get complicated. So let me just jump here to, you know, what if you look at serum three plus uh, at serum or serum at different, uh, uh, you know, serum two plus, three plus, four plus, and so on. In some cases, there can be you know hundreds of transitions. And so you might not be exactly sure what uh, electronic state you're looking at. But you shouldn't let those complications bother you. Uh, you should really just, um, if you have an interesting system and you know that, you know, you know at least the atom you're interested in, you should just go ahead and do the experiment. Okay? And the practical way in which you do it is that you look for the edge, okay? Uh, if you're at synchrotron, you're just going to answer it in your booklet. What's the energy of the edge that you're interested in? Let's say I'm interested in the F electron of serum, but I'm going to be looking for the M edge. You look around on the internet to find out uh, if that has been measured. You look for an instrument that lets you measure that photon regime, and maybe you contact your expert there uh, or the inline sign. The energy of these edges, you know, if you're interested in transition metals and the and, um, 3Ds and, and 4Ds are mostly going to be in the soft x ray, if you go to 5Ds, it's going to be higher in the hard x rays. And then the significant change is what kind of uh, synchrotrons you go to, or uh, because the difference between soft x ray instruments and hard x ray instruments is very large. For soft x rays, there have to be things in vacuum. Uh, for the hard X rays, you can do with different spectrometers and instrumentations. Okay, so let me then tell you a little bit about magnets uh, and couples. Or in the case of those couplets, where 
Uh, the ground state is not magnetic, but magnetic fluctuations are still around. These are called paramagnets. And this is going to be, and, and, and this will highlight some of the best sort of instrumental resolutions of capabilities are available right now. So, so far I'll talk about energy integrated and resonance ray scatter, but now if instead of collecting all those photons, I do the basic spec, you know, spectroscopy. This is not quite uh, the prism and the, and, and, the, and the candle experiment, but the principle is similar. I'm going to take those photons and I'm going to put it through a spectrometer that spreads out, uh, spreads them out spatially depending on their frequency or energy, okay? And then I'm going to image them on a flat detector, and depending on the line where I see, I know that it's a scattering photon of, of different energy. Right? And then we're going to see all these beautiful various uh, photon magnets that do the excitation and so on. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to do this well, what you want to do is to be able to spread out uh, these lines as much as possible so that it's the longer I put my detector away from that point um, where I spread the lines, the better resolution I'm going to get. Okay. So, uh, what they did at the SRF beam line then was to make basically, uh, you know, figure out the technology necessary to make a very long arm. Okay. So that's what I show you. Okay, so uh, that's the detector arm there. It's about 12 meters tall. Okay, the sample itself is not going to be anything here. The light gets scattered, goes to the spectrometer, spreads out the lines, and then you collect them with CCTV cameras that are up here. And you have to be able to do this while having a motion of you know, art degree uh, of angular motion while uh, maintaining without breaking the camera. And then the detector condition, you have to be able to do it in many different ways, but specific positions in the mind of here. So, this, that was a little loud. Uh, although my computer said it was muted. But, uh, that instrument is really the state of the art now, although there is a very similar instrument being um, put together already, uh, starting to uh, uh, be operational at Brookhaven. And that's the one that gives you the So, uh, the progression of the technology for these instruments is just in increasing at a very rapid rate. And, you know, that's probably one of the most difficult uh, instruments right now to get to now. Now, uh, we did get some big time to work on looking at uh, the electron optical rates, okay? So the way we did this experiment now is that uh, for each point in reciprocal space, I'm taking a cut here along H, direction of reciprocal space. Uh, for each point there, you take the spectrum, okay, so these are spectra from different age values, and you can see their peaks, and their peaks are moving around, and things like that. Okay. And if I put them all together in the color plots, and you know, the guesses are different, but you have things that are known to be DB excitations, where you go from one D order to the next, uh, you have the elastic line along here, you have the paramagnets, which look broad, but it's not because of the instrument in this scenario, just because they're intrinsically in the dope system, so it's not very uh, ordered. Uh, there is even a little tiny peak here that you can resolve near the plastic line. Okay. And that is what it is, but uh, it's not very small. So to make the connection to the energy integrated measurement, because uh, it's a point we can miss a lot, if I integrate this over energy, 
Then I get a line that's actually to the intensity versus momentum, and that's the line that I end up with. Okay, so that's that's the connection between the two numbers. And there you see the the attributed charge that's the way. Uh, now the 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 I, I would say what I'm going to show here is that the limit of what the instrument can tell you. Uh, at 300 Kelvin, you see the paramagnetic dispersion here. Okay. I didn't fit this, but it roughly has this form. Uh, but when you go to 25 Kelvin, you see the paramagnetic dispersion here. That I think it looks more like this. Here's the paramagnetic uh, dispersion uh, at 25 Kelvin. And if you measure, this is like roughly four or five days worth of data, you really push the instrument. Uh, what you get is that you see small modifications, but the result of those modifications to your paramagnetic dispersion seems like there might be some uh, change in dispersion, some additional intensity there, some in increased intensity on top of the paramagnetic. And the funny thing is that this is all happening at the charge density wave factor, where you see a charge density wave on the massive line. So, look like the charge density way somehow is affecting the paramagnetic dispersion. Okay? And that's really the beauty of the experiment, that you can sort of measure these different things at the same time. So, uh, to test this, okay, we, you know, to take a map like this, we use the 50 data vector resolution to get a bit more intensity. But if you, we just focus on one particular uh, wave vector there, uh, and compared to one that's off the charge order, you can see that there is indeed an enhancement at the charge order wave vector, the blue vector here, right on top of where the paramagnum energy is okay. So uh, this is just you know, the quality of raw data. This is like the, these two special problems are about uh, 12 or 16 hours. Now, to know what's going on here, right, because now it comes a complication. You're measuring, I'm talking about charge order, charge density waves, and paramagnets at the same time. Uh, what the hell is this? Is this the uh, spin fluid process? Is it magnetic? Or is the charge on top of magnetic? Et okay. And to do this, the next uh, level of technology then for this instrument. Uh, which has just been developed, and uh, there's a paper in preparation uh, of, of instrumentation that's based on the previous concept, is to have a polarimeter, right? So after you spread out the lines, before you look at the CCD, you put another multi-layer, and you either match or look at multi-layer that changes the focus to go to another detector, or you let them go and measure normally. But by putting this element in here, you're changing the ratio of the polarizations of the outcoming component. Okay, so I, I set my incoming polarization with the synchrotron, but the scattered photon, typically, so far what I've shown you, I'm not resolving that it's coming out with linear polarization signal or with high polarization. But if I can now measure, you know, then going through or changing their ratio and then otherwise I can do some linear equations, some linear algorithm, and uh, figure out, you know, explicitly measure only the sigma, sigma prime channel or sigma pi prime channel. And the rule of thumb here is the following is that if you measure, you know, the non uh, the non cross channel, sigma to sigma, that is going to be a charge, thing. and if you measure the sigma to pi prime, that's going to be uh, a spin flip process. Okay? So, uh, we look at the sigma pi prime, the sigma, sigma pi prime doesn't show much, uh, and you can see here that we can clearly see now the paramagnetic dispersion. Okay? And on top of the paramagnetic dispersion, there is indeed an increased intensity at the charge of the wave vector. Okay? So in addition to the elastic charge order, you also have this component 
that's a spin flip, but is that the charge all the way back? And that's a transition back and set the charge all and so on. So there's, there's no intuition here to see that there's a couple of these numbers. Uh, we have a little cartoon picture for what this might be. Um, so if you look, if you imagine that you have a charge next to it of some uh, anti-magnetic correlations, then a fluctuation of that charge next to it in an empty two-bar or a phase on uh, is going to necessarily involve the uh, transfer of charge from one atom to the to the neighbor, and it's going to perhaps force it to uh, add these things. So that's, so this data here, that's now a week worth of data, and uh, they're not going to let us do anything more than that. But uh, this shows me that if I do the push and then resolution, uh, polarization resolution uh, in a great synchrotron and beamline, uh, you can really start to learn a lot about not only uh, magnetism, but also it's coupling to other computers. So, uh, just a couple of other things that uh, my group has been working on, my collaborating with folks uh, that are exciting, so you should have in mind. Uh, one thing we're doing is uh, applying the ISOS train uh, to samples and measuring the scattering fields and so on. If you think that there's an application for whatever problem you're scientifically interested in for uh, state resonance rate scattering in the presence of the actual strength, we have a working device and apparatus. And uh, one thing that a lot of people are actually uh, doing is combining resonance rate scattering okay, with ultra fast uh, uh, optics. Okay, so here is an experiment uh, led by uh, Giacomo Bertolombe <coughs> uh, the OCLS, the free electron laser, uh, Slack. And there, uh, the experiment was sending a uh, 1.5 dB infrared uh, pump photons to excite your system, uh, depending on the temperature you are. You are you can either do a regime where you're Kill the superconductivity for not affecting the charge density wave or affecting the charge density wave because you're not in the superconducting state. And then you can then come with the resonance ray at 932 dB, but with femtosecond, you know, tens of femtosecond resolution in time, and sort of look at the dynamics of this and uh, get looking at these sort of dynamics is something we're interested in. There are also, you know, issues starting to come up. So, uh, come back to the uh, sort of my takeaway messages. Remember, the resonance is king. Uh, it allows you to measure not only, only, you know, take out small electronic states out of the sea of all the electrons in your material, but also allows you to measure different degrees of freedom. Uh, Depending on what you need, I would consider basically just starting with an energy integrated measurement and then moving on to more complex things. Uh, and if you have any ideas of how resonance rates can actually benefit your own research, of course, uh, you can take the talk to a specialist or to myself. So um, I think there's a lot to do with this technique and a lot that's still very unexplored, uh, especially in uh, magnetism.